You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating all things Jewish. Suspicious time of year to be talking about this topic of uh, personal narrative and collective memory coming in the Jewish calendar right after the principal Jewish memory holiday, which is the holiday of Passover, when we recount at Seder's, and I want to just footnote, this is the Jewish ritual that is observed by more American Jews than any other Jewish ritual, the Passover Seder. And I would say, um, I don't have data on this, but I'm pretty sure it's true that it's probably the Jewish ritual that's also observed by more non-Jews uh, than any other Jewish ritual, uh, in part because of the unique conditions that the America, America has provided to Jewish life of total and radical integration for Jews with their non-Jewish neighbors. We'll talk about this more in following. But one of the great challenges, of course, of modern Jewish life is that the boundary between Jews and non-Jews has been broken down. We know that from our own personal experiences, our families, our backgrounds, our friends. Right? The fact that, non, that Jews marry non-Jews in, in dramatic numbers has more to do with the fact that there's no longer a perceived gap or distance between Jews and non-Jews, which is radical in Jewish history. And what it means is that whereas many Jews do continue to gather each year for a Passover Seder for this holiday of memory, Many, many others, some of whom identify as being part of, a Jew, part of a Jewish community in some way, and some of whom have no pretense on being Jewish at all, are also participating in this holiday of Jewish collective memory. And what defines this holiday of Jewish collective memory is a ritual uh, of recounting and retelling a story. And just to be clear, and I think, I hope you remember this, because it really wasn't quite that long ago, <laughs> the obligation the obligation at Passover is not to uh, talk about an event that took place quite a long time ago. The obligation is to relive it, to reenact it. As a result, and I will unpack this more, as a result, even the very story that we tell at the Passover Seder is a bizarre story. At no point do we actually tell the story of the Exodus from Egypt. Most of the time, we tell other people's stories of how they told the Exodus from Egypt, or if you were in my house, most of how we spend our holiday of collective memory is remembering the Passover Seders of previous years. Right? Remember when Bubby did this. Or, right, in my house it was when my grandmother, kind of out of nowhere, just threw a, an entire bag of plastic frogs uh, all over the table during the recounting of the second plague. Um, and in some ways, it was consistent with my grandmother's personality, but it was still quite bizarre. Uh, and of course, remembering uh, those who we have celebrated Passover with who we are not there with today. So the holiday is entirely one about collective memory, but it's a bizarre kind of collective memory. And it's not the memory of, this happened to us a long time ago, and therefore we do X, Y, and Z. It's the memory of reliving and reenacting. The obligation in the liturgy of the Passover Seder is to see ourselves as though we are leaving from Egypt. Now I suspect that a lot of modern Jews don't do this, but for Mediterranean and Middle Eastern Jews, this meant literally putting on, you know, packing suitcases, walking around the table, marching as though you were leaving from Egypt, and literally pretending as though you still belong to a story that was alleged to have happened a long time ago. And that if all you did was tell a story of what happened to your ancestors, you weren't quite doing it right. You had to relive it, you had to reenact it, and you have to pretend as though it was happening to you. So the first condition why it's auspicious for us to be talking about collective memory today is because we're right on the heels of the end of this Passover holiday, which is defined as the primary Jewish holiday of collective memory. But the other reason is that we're also on the verge now, this week and next week, of two relatively new Jewish holidays uh, that some have called the New Jewish High Holy Days, both of them created with the creation of the State of Israel. The first this week, Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and the second next week, which is actually a pair of holidays that go back to back, Yom HaZikaron, uh, 
Israel, Israel's Memorial Day for its fallen soldiers, which dovetails precisely with the Yom HaAtzma'ut, Israel's Independence Day. And both of these modern holidays have at the core of their experience memory, a particular kind of collective memory. And it's, it's fascinating to imagine that with the creation of the State of Israel, what came with it was the creation of new holidays that anchored as part of their experience what it means to recall, to remember. Yom HaShoah, quite obviously, because the primary slogan for Yom HaShoah is what? Never forget, drawn from Deuteronomy, right? You'll never forget what they did to you. So memory is wired into Yom HaShoah and to Holocaust Memorial Day. And for the, even the July 4th of Israel, it's not that you have Memorial Day six weeks earlier as we do here, which has become basically a day marked by sales at the mall, right? <laughs> right, barbecuing. An American civic holiday which is deeply disconnected from its origins as a Memorial Day. In Israel, the Memorial Day, Yom HaZikaron, is deeply intertwined with Israel's Independence Day as if to convey, um, and this is the, to, and it channels a, a legendary Hebrew poet, um, that there is no silver platter on which the state of Israel actually was created, but that it comes as a, a deep cost to human life, and that we remember on those days. And if you've spent time in Israel, Yom HaZikaron is marked by, and Yom HaShoah, in fact, are marked by moments of silence in which sirens ring through the entire country. If you've never seen it, it's something to behold. Uh, not only do people stop wherever they are, take a deep breath, and pause, but cars literally stop on the highway on both Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron. So we're right in the calendar for memory as a key Jewish activity. I want to just problematize this by naming one of the challenges that should already be ringing in your heads. On Passover, which is the primary Jewish holiday of memory, we don't actually remember. We reenact. On Yom HaShoah and Holocaust Memorial Day and on Yom HaZikaron, Israel's Memorial Day for its fallen soldiers, we don't reenact at all, right? We only do a very different kind of modern remembering. So there's actually a deep disconnect, even though we think that these holidays are in relationship with one another because they're right after each other, there's actually a deep disconnect between the activities we do around them. And I want to name that this presents for us two big problems. One, will Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron the modern holidays be able to hold our sway quite the same way that Passover has been able to? And is it possible that part of the reason why so many in Jewish life are struggling around their relationship to Israel and why so many in Jewish life are struggling with trying to figure out what to make of the memory of the Holocaust, that part of that problem may be that we haven't quite figured out how to remember each of them in a way that they've become part of our collective consciousness. The big questions that I think these reflect are not just unique to the Holocaust and the State of Israel, but are actually a much bigger, deeper philosophical question, which is that I think we as Jews are struggling in figuring out how we're supposed to be in deep relationship to a past that we don't always understand and that we sometimes distrust. There's a, a great example of this happened about 10 years ago uh, with Rabbi David Wolpe, uh, who Newsweek recently named, I think for the second year in a row, uh, the number one rabbi in America. Rabbi David Wolpe is the rabbi of Sinai Temple in Los Angeles, a colossal, almost royal synagogue. Uh, in 2010, uh, 2002 uh, or 2003, Rabbi Wolpe got up on Passover morning in his synagogue to give his Passover sermon. Right, so everybody in the shul has, who's, who's at shul uh, on Pesach, Pesach morning has done a Passover Seder the previous night. And the lecture, the sermon that he gave, unpacked all of the various uh, archaeological uh, and historical evidence, or more accurately, lack thereof, uh, for the actual story of the exodus from Egypt. Right? Why it's historically and archaeologically difficult to prove or validate the story as it's told in the Hebrew Bible. It was a magnificent academic lecture. After about 25 minutes, he switches gears and says, in a, almost a moment of radical theology, nevertheless, we are obligated to see ourselves as though we exited from Egypt. 
It's actually a beautiful talk. And then he goes on for 15 to 20 minutes elaborating on this. Not surprisingly, nobody remembers or paid attention to the second half of the talk. <laughs> right? The entire attention of the audience was wrapped in this essential, you can't disprove that something happened 5,000 years ago. Right? As, uh, as scholars often say, the, ev the, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Right? If I can't prove something happened a long time ago, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means that you've built a castle on potentially sand. Right? It's a myth in the literal sense of a story of an unprovable but very significant story, but not necessarily history, not necessarily factual. Now, what was fascinating was Rabbi Wolpe, standing in a conservative congregation, assumed that the majority of the people in the room already didn't believe that the exodus had happened. And so the novelty of his speech was intended to be the second half. Since I know that you don't believe this stuff that you think that you do anyway, I'm going to try to give you some tools by which to stand in deep and meaningful relationship to the past. It turns out that a lot of the people in the room had essentially been operating with a cognitive dissonance. Right? They're not sure whether they actually believe, they, they kind of held on to it even though much of their life choices were not tied into what you would hold on to if you were holding on to some stories as being true for 5,000 years ago. And so he spent the second day of Passover <laughs> doing a Q&A. He threw out his sermon for the second day of Passover and did a Q&A with his congregants to deal with the aftermath of the fact that he had shattered for them some sort of pristine image of the Jewish past that they now, they now had to rehabilitate. The story, predictably, got a lot of news. Right? New York Jewish Week ran it on its front page. Conservative rabbi disputes a uh, story of Exodus in synagogue on Passover. Right? It's like it's great Jewish news. Um, there was something impolitic about the speech. It got a lot of different kind of diagnoses, which I won't go into, of what it was about, why it made people so upset. But what to me it suggested was that we as Jews are not completely sure what to make of the modern experience and its relationship to the truths, the, the, the past, the history that we know as Jews matters enormously to us, but we're not entirely sure that we have the tools to make sense of it. And I think the two best examples for how this plays out are obviously the, talk of the topic for today, which is Holocaust in Israel, but I, I tell the Wolpe story because I want to convey that I don't think this is a new problem, and I don't think that the Holocaust in Israel are the only sites at which this is actually uh, challenging us, that it actually goes to the heart of all of these Jewish ideas from the past that we as Jews know matter to being Jewish. You kind of have to think that old things are important if you're going to be part of Jewish life. And at the same time, we as moderns tend to believe that old things are less good, less important, and less valuable as new things. That we, as the products of the evolutionary chain, stand on top of what comes before us rather than on the bottom of it. So Holocaust and Israel are two places at which this tension is perhaps most obviously manifest, but it's, it signifies that it's the symptoms of a larger uh, existential problem for contemporary Jews. Holocaust, obviously, because and there are now news and statistics about this. I think there was even a story today about it in Yediot Achronot, a kind of perverse story at the, about the rate at which Holocaust survivors are dying, that within 20 years, maybe 25, we're going to be living as a community without survivors anymore. So what do you make as a community of memory? How do you hold on to memory? when the witnesses of it, those who have actually been the architects of the communal memory, are not around anymore to shepherd it. And Israel, and I'll talk about this more, uh, is another site at which the loss of collective memory is becoming more and more challenging. When I talk to older audiences, I do this, you know, well, maybe, maybe we can try it here. How many people in the room have a relative who lives in Israel? All right, so that's actually a pretty good representation, right, of a certain generation of American Jews. If this room was full of 18 to 22 year olds, you would get a fraction of the hands up in the room, and that's the people who are showing up to a lecture. Right? But a whole variety of factors are conspiring to suggest that American Jews are both literally and figuratively disconnected from the memory or the personal relationship to the story of Israel. 
right? I don't have to ask you to raise your hands to see how many people in the room lived through 1967 or 1948. There are many, right? If you had 18 to 22 year olds in the room, of course, that would be quite different. And so the relationship both to the Holocaust and Israel is on totally new ground because the prevailing conditions that created the Holocaust in Israel as key features of contemporary Jewish identity are being challenged not in the philosophical sense but in the literal sense by the fact that we're just a different Jewish community today than we were 20 to 30 years ago. So I think we as a community are struggling with a deep past. We know it's important. We know it matters to Jewishness, but we don't spend quite enough time thinking about the tools that we need to have to hold on to that past in the face of the contemporary challenges that we face. I think there are three major ways in which modernity is challenging our relationship to collective memory. The first is the triumph of the individual over the collective. Right? The Jewish community for about 20 years has been talking with language of Jewish peoplehood. Right? Peoplehood. That, that being part of a collective, belonging to a people, is something that is intrinsically important to being Jewish. If you don't see yourself as part of a people and you only see yourself as an individual, you've missed a key component, com component of being Jewish. I agree with that. I think it's a really important set of ideas. But nothing about modern, modern life, forget about Jewish life, nothing about modern life reiterates that phenomenon. We are inclined to believe by virtue of the civilization in which we live, that we can, as individuals, triumph over anything, that is personal fulfillment, right, is, is actually a much greater value than belonging to a collective. This isn't, I'm not saying anything I hope is countercultural here. This is Bowling Alone, the book by Robert Putnam from now 20 years ago, right? That this is the, the phenomenon that more Americans experience is the loss of civic institutions and that core sense of belonging to something in place in, and what's been replaced with is the narrative of personal destiny and fulfillment. Now I think uh, according to the New York Times two weeks ago I think 38 percent of Americans now live alone, yeah. right? An amazing statistic, right? By far the most in history. So both as, uh, as members of a society that promotes individual destiny, but even as Jews, right, there's a rise of the individual in some ways at the loss of the collective. And so the very idea that you would belong to a collective memory seems unbelievably foreign to us. <coughs> even the very idea I would convert to Judaism and acquire a memory, that goes against how we think memory works. Memory is the stuff that happens to me. Right? It's, the, it's the reverse negative photographic images in my mind. So what does it mean to belong to a story that wasn't my parents and grandparents' story? It's a radical and novel idea that still needs to be worked out. A second challenge. We value empiricism over myth. That's the Wolpe story. Show me something I can prove. Demonstrate it to me and I'll get behind it. We as moderns trust our eyes, we trust the scientific method, we trust historical methodologies much more than we trust a story that people told us is important but, didn't, but can't prove it to us. Right? This is one of the great challenges of being a college student, right? especially a college student who went to Hebrew school, let's say, where I show up at college and without, without necessarily any malice, one of my professors will tell me that everything that I've learned is wrong. Right? That I was the, they were pulling the, wools over my, oh, pulling the wool over my eyes. And I say not necessarily with malice, because oftentimes it actually is with malice. Right? That there's something about the developmental process of growing up that we believe that the stories we were told earlier are less good than what we can actually learn and discover for ourselves. Right? If all you do is rely on the stories that have been told to you beforehand, you're basically a fundamentalist. You're not actually looking to explore, to uncover, to figure out, was this actually true? I'll talk about this more, but uh, with respect particularly to the Israel example, there's a study done last year by Hebrew University professors about day school students. So you would think Jewish students who have the most Jewish education, Right? And the most, perhaps the most committed households because their parents are making this financial commitment for their Jewish education at staggering sums. That day school students overwhelmingly believe that when their schools talk to them about Israel, that they're being sold a bill of goods. 
It's an amazing comment for a couple of reasons, one of which is they don't seem to believe that the school is selling them a bill of goods about Judaism <laughs> or Talmud. But something about the way the school is talking to them about Israel makes them feel as though they're being sold a bill of goods. So even at a relatively young age, right, and we want ourselves, our children, our students to be this. We want them to be so inquiring and inquisitive that they don't take what we say to them at, at face value, that they push back, that they learn it on their own, that they apply discipline and methodology. And in this case, when it comes to Israel, all they have to do is read the news. Right? When things are not so good and the school comes in and tells them of what their obligations are with respect to supporting and liking Israel and tells them a mythical story of Israel's origins and it goes against what they're reading in the news, that they believe that they're being sold a bill of goods, and that's a natural human instinct. So another problem with collective memory, if the first was the individual over the collective, the second is we trust our own eyes and ears much more than we trust a myth or a story that's told to us. I'm, I'm sure if we went around and said, can you find, a, you know, this is the whole, idea, the whole very idea of the notion of coming of age story is that when you come of age, you realize that not everything that you were told was true, that perhaps there were good educational, pedagogical reasons why the people who loved you told you a story that they wanted you to believe in here, but that it's not what you actually discover when you're out on your own. So when it comes to Judaism, to Holocaust in Israel, a second big challenge we face is that we trust our own eyes and ears over the myths that are being told to us. And the third big challenge is that we trust new things much more than we trust old things. Right? There's a phenomenon um, which I'll acknowledge as a 35-year-old is extremely grating to me, right? is the language of the greatest generation. Right? For, for a long time, right, and this was like a feature of the nightly news under Tom Brokaw for a while <laughs> while I was um, in high school, it was this fixation with the greatest generation, which actually resonates with a classic Jewish idea that the past generations are better than the current generations. It's called Yiridat HaDorot. That once upon a time, we're the really good people, and we are the inferior shells of those who have come before us. And therefore, it's good in terms of like mobilizing social capital. Therefore, our objective is to try to restore the good stuff that people before us used to do better than us. Right? They lived through all this stuff. They bequeathed us to us. We are merely the inferior people who come next. It's the cultural equivalent of kids these days. Right? That notion that kids are not nearly as good as their parents. And I would say it is not only an idea that's distrusted by the young, it's an idea that is basically challenged by living as a modern human being. I don't think we as a society continue to believe that old things are intrinsically better than new things. And even if we do believe it, it has become bad public policy. It's not a surprise that uh, a presidential candidate gets elected with virtually no political experience, but preaching a message of hope to young people. Right? It's not a surprise. It's compelling. It's American. Right? It resonates with what it is that we want to be talking about, which is not things were better back then and we want to restore it which actually in interesting ways has become part of this year's presidential campaign, right? That somehow things are better and how do we get back to that kind of the 1950s pastoral bucolic, everything was better in the 1950s. Is there anyone in the room who would agree that the 1950s were objectively better than the 20, 2010, than today? Yes? At, at minimum, it's a good debate, right? There was a lot of things that were really bad about the 1950s, right? Especially if you weren't uh, a white, white male, right? Um, it's hard to make the claim that everything old is better than everything, everything new. You know, and I, I like to say, it's as though when Jews talk about this, they pretend as though uh, Tevye the Dairyman was the pinnacle of Jewish history. <laughs> the shuttle was horrible, right? Horrible. So why, when we imagine, right, in our, when we talk about a collective story, that the old stuff is important just because it's old, it is not going to be a compelling story that helps us to bridge to a contemporary reality in which we don't trust that old things are necessarily better than new things, or we tend to believe that they actually are necessarily worse. So three big challenges. Uh, and they map quite obviously on the challenges that we face today. 
Again, with the demise of a Holocaust survivor generation and the consciousness that somehow the Holocaust has to be part of an ongoing Jewishness, but we don't really necessarily yet have the tools to figure that out. And increasingly, and this should be no surprise, for more and more American Jews who are not convinced that Israel necessarily needs to be a feature of their Jewishness, that they can be very proudly Jewish without Israel as a feature of that, right? And they did not live through the Israel of collective memory that their parents' and grandparents' generation did. Let's start with Israel, then we'll do the Holocaust, and we'll see. I'm generally better at naming challenges than I am answers. But maybe through our conversation, uh, we'll surface some more, um, some more responses. Uh, So I, as I mentioned, I'm 35 years old. When I was 17, I went to live in Israel for two years. Uh, after a day school education and after growing up in a household in which Israel, and particularly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, was the subject of every Shabbat dinner conversation we had. Um, nevertheless, 17 to 19, that's you know, the big coming of years, the coming of age is years. And I, like many other people uh, in the Orthodox day school upbringing that I shared, uh, used that time to go study in Israel, uh, in an Israeli yeshiva. I went for two years, and I was uh, in Gush Etzion, on the West Bank. This is 1994 to 1996. My formative experience living as a Jew in Israel during that time was marked by, first, the assassination of the Prime Minister in the fall of 1995, and then for the remainder of that year, and actually a little bit beforehand, uh, a spate of suicide bombings that uh, terrorized and paralyzed the Israeli civilian population in Israel. Um, I like to compare that to my father's, because you know, since we mentioned my father earlier as part of the data, my father's formative experience was in 1967 when he was 18 years old, getting on a plane, I have no idea how he got this past my grandparents, but got on the plane the day that the Six Day War ended, showed up in Israel with nothing and said, I'm here to volunteer. <coughs> and spent about two weeks or even longer cleaning up Mount Scopus uh, and preparing it for ultimately the reopening of the university, the reopening up in the hospital, and so on. Right? If you go back even further, my grandparents' formative experiences with Israel, they were not 18 years old, they were a little older. Their formative experiences with Israel were 1948, or more accurately, probably the space between 1945 and 1948, right? the gap between that period of time when Jews went from being the least powerful that we ever were as a people to an accumulation of power that was radically different than anything that Jews had experienced before in their history. And the naming, the uh, announcing of a, a vibrant and stable state of Israel, that it took several wars worth and 20 years to fully stabilize, but symbolized a kind of moment of history that was, that was really a dayenu. It was really enough. Right? And that, that was enough for my grandparents to stabilize their relationship to Israel, independent of the fact that I now have been to Israel literally hundreds of times. I think my grandparents probably went twice or three times. And nevertheless, I remember their hallway in their apartment in Brooklyn lined with Israel bonds plaques. Right? There was a kind of intrinsic life experience creates obligation and commitment that simply is harder to channel and maintain today. If life experience is supposed to animate, if, I, if by viscerally and intrinsically living through a moment in history, it's enough for me to be able to then have a lifelong commitment that's going to work for the people who live through positive life experience, it's just not going to work for people who live through negative life experience. Right? Think of this through the frame of, 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 of any sort of, if I, if, I, if I have a happy, if I experience something happy and positive, I am going to relate to it fundamentally differently than if I relate to than, than the alternative. For, mod, for contemporary Jews, for the generation even beneath me, right, the Israel that they're living through is the Israel of the news today. It's very difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible, nor am I claiming that Israel has nothing to offer contemporary Jews. That's not the point at all. The point is, however, that we've actually been riding as a community on a mechanism and a system to, to cultivate support for, love for Israel, and the notion that Israel should be an intrinsic part of Jewishness with a basic laziness. The laziness was, it works for me. I lived through this. 
In fact, it's quite interesting. When I talk to a lot of Jews about Israel these days and how to be talking about and how to be in relationship to Israel, and I talk to a lot of, uh, let's say, Jews of, of this one or two generations that are in front of me, and they oh, I always get the comment, we're okay. Talk to our grandkids. And the answer I always give is part of the reason your, grandparent, your grandkids are not okay is because you might not be as okay as you think. Because if you weren't able to tell them this story about Israel in a way that was perhaps as compelling as the Passover story or the Purim story or your own story, right, that signified a kind of, did you not have the tools necessarily to do that? The part of the reason they're asking that question is because it's not totally clear that they knew, even within the context of households where it was intrinsic and obvious, that it was necessarily uh, so obvious to the people who, who said so. So 1967 versus 1995. I'll give you another problematic example. <clears throat> a figure in the news virtually uh, every 10 minutes now, especially if you read a certain subset of the news, is a young man named Peter Beinart, who just wrote a book called The Crisis of Zionism. Right? Peter Beinart self-identifies as being an Orthodox Jew, lives in New York, uh, self-identifies as being a supporter and lover of the State of Israel, and his mechanism has been through pressuring the state of Israel through very public ways to uh, change its policies vis-a-vis -vis the settlements in the West Bank and to pressure the American Jewish community by claiming it has been a scandal of the American Jewish community that they have simply fostered support for the elected government of the state of Israel rather than pushing back against it when it's against Israel's interests, right, in the paternalistic sense, right? We think it's against Israel's interests, so we shouldn't be supporting it. Peter is actually a sim symptom of the 1967 versus 1995 problem, right? This is his reality. If you want to be in relationship to Israel, this is the reality that you face. It's not, I lived through 1967. It's, this is the present that I have, and this is the future I want to shape. His, his, his interlocutors, very classically, are Abe Foxman of the Anti-Defamation League, right? For whom the story of the Holocaust is still the primary driver uh, of his attitudes towards Israel, and David Harris of the American Jewish Committee, who is actually the, ch the child of survivors. So the personal narrative, right, of all these individuals is highly relevant to the public policy they're trying to put forward, and the consequence is that they are increasingly lacking the shared collective memory. Because in both cases, they're actually prioritizing the personal over the collective. Those, they, they has implications for the collective, but my story really matters to the Israel that I want or the Holocaust that I remember. So there's all of these different phenomena of these questions of what do I live through and how does it play out to the collective that I want to be a part of. But there's another final, one, one more example that I think is really, um, is really phenomenal for this whole question of, of the history that we have and the memory that we want to create. Uh, about 25 years ago, a scholar named Benny Morris uh, produced a magnum opus of a piece of research called The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem. I think it was 1947 to 1951 or so. It's a virtually unreadable book. Um, it's hundreds of pages, meticulously footnoted. And Benny Morris was part of a group of historians who self-identified as being revisionist historians meaning they wanted to go back to the myths that Israel had used to tell its story and to challenge the, the truth of those myths. And one of the myths that they wanted to challenge about the State of Israel was that in 1948, after the State of Israel came about, the Palestinians merely picked up from their houses and fled. Right? That the refugee problem of Palestinian refugees who want to go back not to the West Bank but to Haifa, Ramla, and Lod, in the myth, in the official story of the Israeli government, they had gotten up and left, and therefore relinquished their right to return. And Benny Morris thoroughly, painfully documents the extent to which many of the departures of the Palestinians during these times were forcible and violent. So that the state of Israel's myth that was in intrinsic to public policy and public opinion was just that, a myth. He did to the Palestinian refugee problem what David Wolpe did to the Exodus. And actually, he shaped a generation. A lot of what emerged as kind of post-Zionism, Israelis reckoning with their realities and with their truths, 
right? A lot of it stemmed out of these historians doing this kind of work. Rather astonishingly, about five or six years ago, Benny Morris published another interview. This time, an astonishing interview in which he said, now remember it's how, how insane this is. His whole thesis had been that Israel bore culpability for the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem. And you would imagine, what's the therefore? The therefore is, you break it, you buy it, right? If you've done this wrong, you therefore have a responsibility to fix the problem. Benny Morris, in that, I think a 2005 interview, comes out as a dramatic right-winger and says, yes, the Israelis created this problem, and they should have gone further. He gives an almost genocidal comment about the Palestinians. Now, what's amazing is nobody really cared. In other words, the breaking apart of the historical paradigm was much more significant in shaping how people were thinking about this than his deciding that he didn't like the political ramifications of history itself. There's two interesting things in it. One is that historian looks at it and says, I think that we did something wrong here and I don't care, almost like David Wolpe with the Exodus, says this may not have been historically accurate, but we bear some resp responsibility toward it. But what's more interesting to me is that more Jews were rattled by the original historical scholarship than by actually the act of what he deemed as his repentance. And again, you get this struggle. What happens when we know more about our story than we really, run, than we really want to know? And does it actually make us feel less inclined to care about, feel passionate towards, be animated in support for the, 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 it, whether it's Israel or the Holocaust itself? When you rupture, right, when you rupture the core truths that hold you in relationship to something profound, how do you put the pieces back together again? What does it mean for Jews to actually look at a at an Israel that is not the intrinsic, visceral Israel of their parents and grandparents? What does it mean for young Jews to look at an Israel that they don't necessarily relate to because they don't have cousins there anymore? And most problematically, what does it mean for young Jews to look at an Israel that the truth is ug a little uglier than it might have been represented to them? And with all of those prevailing conditions, to still walk away and say, I still see myself as though I left Egypt. Right? I still see myself in deep relationship to this, despite or perhaps because of all of its flaws and challenges. Let's go to the Holocaust, just to lighten things up. For three generations since the Holocaust, uh, the priority for who gets to tell and own the story of the Holocaust itself has belonged exclusively to the survivor generation. Right. This has been the very adamant declaration by Elie Wiesel, who represents in many ways the public ethical consciousness, both for Jews and non-Jews, about the Holocaust. Right? That the, the very explicit demands that nobody can say anything in the presence of survivors right, that trumps or takes greater validity than the survivors themselves. Right? Or, uh, alternatively, the theological framing of this comes from the theologian Eliezer Berkowitz, who writes, I'm going to just read this incredible quote, in Faith After the Holocaust, written in the early 1960s, right, trying to wrestle with the theological implications of the Holocaust. He says as follows, those of us who were not there must, before anything else, heed the responses of those who were, for theirs alone are the authentic ones. For theirs alone are the authentic ones. Right? If you live in the presence of survivors, their responses are the only authentic responses for the, the world community and the Jewish community to reckon with. This should be familiar from most Yom HaShoah commemorations that you may have been to. They are certainly true of the Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Memorial Day commemorations that I grew up with, which were defined by what? Anybody? What do you do? You invite a survivor. You invite a survivor. And the survivor comes and tells that story. It's not what you would do on Passover, right? Do we invite a survivor? I mean, do we invite it, right? But you in Eliyahu Hanavi, right? The the uh, right the Forrest Gump of Judaism. Um, 
we don't we not only don't but but we not only don't invite a survivor we don't also do on passover is recount somebody's tale because what are we what are we imagining is supposed to happen with future yom hashoah celebrations when there aren't survivors anymore what do we think is supposed to happen my guess is that this is why we've been spending so much time recording testimonials because what will probably in the problem in the conventional understanding of this i think is that we're going to bring everybody into the synagogue or the JCC or this room and we're going to put on a tape. Right? Or we're going to listen to someone else's narrative about their story. Educationally, I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, and I also wonder, and you hear it in the Passover question, and I, wanna, I, I just want to cushion this by saying I'm I, I am conscious of, and I'm, I'm respectful of the dignity of what Wiesel and Berkowitz are pushing for. Right? There is an obscenity in trying to speak about the Holocaust in the presence of people who live through it. But the, the reverse challenge of it is that when the entire story is supposed to, on one hand, matter to Judaism, and on the other hand, can only be told by those who live through it, you're going to produce an obvious cognitive dissonance at the end of the day, where it's no longer obvious to anyone who didn't live through it why it matters so much because it's not their story. In uh, the 80s, an Orthodox rabbi in Riverdale, uh, not far from here, tried to correct this problem by producing a Yom HaShoah Haggadah. It's obscene, actually, right? Because in the presence of survivors, how could you, know, and you can imagine what the rituals of a Yom HaShoah Haggadah are like. You eat potato skins, you cordon off the children in the corner. It's obscene with their Holocaust survivors in the room, to sit in a carpeted plush room and eat potato skins is obscene. <laughs> and yet, what do we do on the Passover Seder, but we drink, we eat the potato dipped in, you know, the potato, the Eastern European uh, green vegetable. Um, we, dip a, <laughs> we dip a potato in salt water to reenact the tears of our ancestors, right? We eat haroset to mirror the cement that they had to labor with, right? We, 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 we kind of pretend to remodel the suffering that they actually experienced in order to understand the redemption on the other side. Now, it's hard to imagine, again, in an age in which survivors are actually around, that you would attempt to reenact their sufferings in a way that would seem almost like a mocking, a perverse mocking of what they actually went through. But on a deep level, it seems that we have a disjuncture between the Judaism of the memory that we try to cultivate on Passover and the memory that we're trying to produce with respect to the Holocaust. What's also key, um, see, Elie Wiesel, as many of you know, right, the book Night, which is, of course, his dominant uh, piece of literature about the Holocaust, and I use that term very specifically, piece of literature, underwent dramatic revisions in its translation from French to English. What does that mean? It's not actually that the survivor's memoir is, bet is more important than a non-survivor's story. I'm sorry, it is more important. It's, it's not about the genre, it's actually about the individual. When a survivor tells an embellished story, it is better than a non-survivor telling an embellished story. And what we've produced in the public consciousness is a, is a kind of a literarily weird phenomenon where the, by virtue of the fact that something is produced by a survivor, we treat it fundamentally different than if it's a great piece of literature produced by a non-survivor. So a scholar named Ruth Franklin, who writes for the New Republic, who has a wonderful book on this called, uh, just out last year, called A Thousand Darknesses, Lies and Truth in Holocaust Fiction. Right? One of the arguments that she makes in the book is, good literature is good literature. Right? Why do we make a moral assumption that a memoir that's told by a survivor of their experience is better for us in understanding the Holocaust than a piece of fiction that somebody writes about the Holocaust? The worst scandal you can do in Jewish life is to, pretend, is to, to push forward a story that you claim is true about the Holocaust when it's not true. And what it means is that we've locked ourselves in this perverse game in which we're using the language of truth only with respect to things that are historically verifiable and not with respect to truth in the lofty, magnificent, magical sense of actually teaching us something meaningful about the world. Is the Passover story true? I don't know. 
I certainly can't verify it. David, if David Wolpe can't verify it, I can't verify it. Is it true in the, ma in the mythical sense? Of course. It tells a supreme human story of going from bondage to freedom. It's a story about human responsibility for the world. It's a story about particularism. It's a story about peoplehood. It's a story about truth in all of the most broad sense. And yet when it comes to our most recent story of our human suffering as a people, a story that was about the Jewish people being designated as other, marginalized, destroyed, murdered, terrorized, right? We only are clinging to historically legitimate truth. And it's, in its, its own way, it has its own kind of perversity. A number of years ago, I, I spent some time as a um, research assistant at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. <clears throat> now, I don't, um, it's not my field. <laughs> uh, and it was a tough sell. But one of the things I came in and I talked to them about was, there's this bizarre phenomenon in the context of Holocaust studies. Um, and uh, it's been verified by some of the experts in the room that in a lot, of, a lot of the world of Holocaust studies, there is a bias towards what you might call perpetrator history over victim history. Because the Nazis were much better during the war at keeping records than the Jews. Right? Um, the consequence is that scholars, and for very legitimate historical reasons, have to look askance at a memoir in a way that they don't at a historical document. The historical documents are the stories of the Nazis for which the Jews are merely the victims. A memoir, however embellished, is a very different kind of story of human consciousness that in theory should matter much more to us as Jews than the records of camp inmates. But when I got to the Holocaust Memorial Museum, the overwhelming amount of study and research done on the Holocaust is on the kind of pure history side. What happened where to whom and how did it play out? One of the things I noticed is that there was this several volumes of shelves in the Holocaust Museum that of books that were never checked out. These are books called Yiskerbicher. Anyone ever hear of the Yiskerbicher? Yep. Okay, I got a handful of people. The Yiskerbicher were um, books compiled mostly in the 1950s and usually in Israel by groups of survivors that used to get together once a year to remember their village or shtetl or town. And what they started to do in the 1950s is designate one of the people in the group to collect as many stories or postcards or maps or lists of residents, right? All sorts of information and compile it in a book that has no quality as a book. They're just these kind of weird scrapbooks. So even calling it a genre of literature is actually quite challenging because they don't hold together from book to book. The books were not intended for anyone to read. They were to be preserved. And the consequence is that you have this whole genre of literature, there's like 1,200 of them, that a room of learned Jews predominantly doesn't know about. And that if you go spend time in Israel and go to a used bookstore, you will probably find them on the shelves because the grandkids came across some book that they didn't really understand, didn't know what it was for, and so they got rid of it. There is frightfully little research that's done into these Yisker And part of the reason is, when I, so I got to the museum, I opened these books, and as a Jewish studies scholar, the books are a gold mine. Because when Jews tell their story as a memorial story, they use all sorts of language from the Bible, from rabbinics. They tell a Jewish story that to a historian is undecipherable. Because if you, don't know, if you don't know that the first line of a book is a paraphrased version of the Book of Lamentations, it sounds like nonsense. So the story of the Holocaust is being told primarily through very legitimate historical mechanisms in a way that's actually making it inaccessible to us as Jews, both because we're not the survivors ourselves and also because even if we're conversant in Jewish language, we don't use the survivor's language or even their own stories. We're so fearful of embellishment that we lose our own literature in the process. It's hard to state how over radical this is, how, how radical this is in the context of Jewish history. Right? If you remember the High Holidays, one of the key, key, key pieces of the High Holiday liturgy is the recounting of the death of the ten martyrs in the hands of the Romans. Right? This violent story in the middle of the High Holiday liturgy which, and I'll tell you, this is my field, is completely historically inaccurate. 
you have ten martyrs who are described as being murdered one after another in a sequence by an evil emperor, many of whom didn't live in the same time period as each other. Right? Why do the rabbis do this to the High Holiday Liturgy? Because it's not about the specifics of the historical moment. It's about what you learn from it. It's about the fact that you take a pause during the richest moment of the liturgy of the whole High Holiday year, and you acknowledge the costs from which it's come, you put together human suffering to, on, on the specific sense with human suffering on the global sense, right? You make it matter. And in, in contrast, right, it would be the equivalent of saying, we're going to pause now the high holiday service for Rabbi Akiva, who we have recorded on video, to tell his story of being massacred by the Romans. Right? Of course, it's, it's ludicrous. Now, I'm drawing this not to be humorous. I'm drawing it because what, we mean, what it means is when we talk in the language of knowing that memory matters to ourselves as Jews as, and collective memory matters, but we're using tools by which to animate conversation about Israel and the Holocaust that are actually outside of the parameters of how Jews have classically talked about memory, it is no wonder that it's increasingly challenging for us for, um, to imagine the ways in which memory will continue to matter to Jews in the present and the future. So I'll give one last example. I know I, I want to do, do want to take some questions. Um, I'll give one last example and hopefully offer uh, a couple of thoughts for how we might move forward. The last example, and I, it really is worth looking at, is Alana Newhouse, who's now the editor of Tablet Magazine, writes a piece a couple years ago about the Roman Vishniak photos for the New York Times Magazine. Roman Vishniak, the photos, the shtetl, a lost world, a vanished world, lost world. The vanished world. A lot of new house in the New York Times Magazine goes back and discovers that, lo and behold, um, the whole thing was a constructed piece of myth. That Roman Vishniak was sent by the Joint Distribution Committee to chronicle what was going on in Europe, and that the pictures were carefully cropped, and they were provided captions that didn't reflect the reality of what was actually taking place. The most famous one of which is a person who's, who ducked behind a door looking out fearfully on the street, which they cropped to make it look like it was about fear. But actually, there was a parade going by. But they wanted to tell a particular story. Now, what happens when someone disabuses the Jewish community of the myth of Roman Vishniak? The story is told in the letters to the editor, and it's really worth taking a few minutes to Google it. Because you get two responses. One response says, thank God somebody did away with that story. I'd never liked it. Right? The, we should, the, better that we tell the real story of the shtetl, even though it's much less inspiring, but that's the story we need to tell. And other people said, don't you dare take away my Roman Vishniak. I need that story. In both of these cases, right, when we talk about Holocaust, we talk about Israel. The challenge that we currently face is that all of these factors from the, from the conditions of modernity are making it very difficult on one hand to hold on to a story to which people don't have a personal relationship. On the other hand, we feel the pressing need as a community to figure out a way in which to re, and I use this language very problematically, to re-Judaize Israel and the Holocaust in order to make a continued matter to Jewish collective memory. I think there are mechanisms by which that might happen I think the tools for them are really still quite remote. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.